Shane Warne, welcome. G'day, Tom. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Great to have you on the follow-on podcast. You've been busy. Yeah, geez, there's been plenty going on. We're going to talk about the Big Bash. We're going to talk about the Pakistan tour. But clearly the biggest issue in Australian sport right now, I think, is Justin Langer. And we're going to delve into it pretty deeply. But broadly speaking, Warnie, do you believe it was the right call for a Cricket Australia to essentially sack Justin Langer? I know technically they didn't, but they've moved him on by offering him a six-month six contract. Is this the right call? Well, first of all, um, I'd say no. Um, and it's a sort of a long, I think you have to sort of delve a little bit deeper on why it's the wrong decision. I think when they offered him six months, um, that was basically to defend your title of the World Cup. That was a bit of an insult um, and a token that he would actually have no option other, to, other than to resign. Uh, so I was a bit disappointed about all of that. And I think the way Cricket Australia have handled the whole, forget it's even Justin Langer. Mm. This is Australia's number one sport. It's a global sport. It's the second biggest sport in the world is cricket. So to treat the head coach, Justin Langer, the way they have, or any head coach of the Australian men's cricket team, is an absolute disgrace what Cricket Australia have done. And, it can, and, and it's just as recently as Tim Payne. Whether he deserved another summer or not is irrelevant. They knew about Tim Payne and still allowed him to captain Australia and then swept it under the carpet. And when someone found out, they go, oh, they just threw him under the bus. I mean, what is this organisation doing? It's, it, it's, it, as I said, it's the second biggest sport in the world. It's the number one Australian sport. And this is what the organisation is running, this, the cricket, the men's side of the cricket. It is absolutely terrible the way they have handled this Justin Langer. And I think if you ask anyone in the street, they say, oh, we mightn't like Justin Langer. He's a bit intense, but what have they done? So whether you like him or not, it's irrelevant. The, the, the handling of this is just absolutely disgraceful what Cricket Australia have done. So let's just take a step back, Tom, and work out when Justin Langer took over. Yep. Justin Langer took over after Sandpaper Gate, and we still don't know the truth about what actually happened at Sandpaper Gate. Does Cricket Australia know the truth? Do they? Do the same people know the truth about Sandpaper Gate? Are they hiding anything? We've seen that the, the fast bowlers and the bowling cartel, as they call themselves, or, or Winks and the Goat and all these unbelievable nicknames they have for themselves. These guys wrote a letter saying they had no knowledge of whatever's going on. Now, that might be correct. But if it's not, and they've done that, there's all sorts of whispers and rumours that we all have heard. And one day the truth will come out. Does Cricket Australia know the truth? Is it the truth that we heard? Why should Smith and Warner be the only two? Who knows? But the truth will come out. And if Cricket Australia are hiding something again, after Justin Langer, the Tim Payne, we can go on about all the controversies that Cricket Australia have just bundled and bungled and just messed up and handled completely wrong. Mm. So there's a lot to go. So Justin Langer takes over after all of that. Australia lose to India. They lose to India B last summer when six or eight of the Indian players went home. We lost at the Gabba for the first time in donkey's years. No one fears Australia anymore. They, they, they lose the West Indies. They lose to Bangladesh in an undermanned team, yes. So Justin Langer might be intense. He might be too harsh. He might be brutal. But you know what? The players might have needed it because they weren't performing. So suddenly after this whole intervention that we've seen, that we heard about, that Justin Langer has taken a bit more of a step back and he's done all, listened to more of assistant coaches, let the players do a bit more, this player power movement and all this rubbish. I wish we had that when we were around, Tom, because maybe half the team that hated John Buchanan, we might have been able to throw him out. <laughs> anyway, so we go back to where Justin was and all of these kicks up the backside, the integrity that Justin Langer and credibility that he brought back to the Australian cricket team, we're finally starting to see it after all these losses against India twice at home. I mean, we don't lose, Australia don't lose at home. We lost twice and won to India B and they chased over 300. So it's not a great Australian cricket team we're talking about here. But what Justin Langer did through those three or four years is starting to see the all that hard work that he put in, all the losses, we're just starting to see the rewards for his hard work. 
his brutalness, his intensity, his kick up the backside to the players. You know why? They needed it. So to see that the Winner World Cup, which is the first time ever Australia's done that, it's hard to do to win a T20 World Cup. They did it. What an achievement. Outstanding for everyone. And then to smash England, to blow them away like the Australian side did, fantastic. So we're just starting to see after all those losses after the last few years, and even recently, we're just starting to see the success come from this not great Australian cricket team, but they're starting on their way. If they can do this for another five, six years and start not losing at home, beat India at home, beat India away, beat England away, then we start might start talking about this is a great Australian cricket team, but they're not at the moment. So to just have that a power, then what we're hearing is that the New South Wales mafia decided they weren't, they'd lost uh, Justin Langer, they'd lost, he'd lost the dressing room, uh, they didn't like his style. Well, they better start performing. You know, they've got to perform. And I go back to what we said on Fox during the summer. How do you judge a coach? You judge is cricket in a better shape when he left than when he started. Absolutely. Give him a huge tick. So winning a World Cup in an Ashes after losing all those series to India B, India twice, West Indies, Bangladesh, all those losses that they've had, to start to see the success the Australian side's having now, to then get rid of the guy that's helped implement all that, just doesn't make sense to me. So I'm I'm absolutely staggered because if the players don't like it, that's fine. It's all about the results and is Australian cricket, men's cricket, in better shape now? Yes, it is. So I I was staggered that Justin Langer uh, was only offered six months. So I want to talk to you about player power because it's something that I think has a lot of people in the street confused. And I've read a couple of articles about Bob Simpson being the coach before my time, but clearly you were part of that team as a young man and how tough he was. And then John Buchanan, you've been outspoken about him. At what point does player power become so strong that Cricket Australia has no choice but to make the hard call? That's an interesting one. Um, I dipped my toe in being a head coach uh, for the London Spirit last year and unfortunately got COVID. So I was only around for a couple of games. I'm doing it again this year to see if I like it. But it was interesting working with the current day and modern day player. It's a completely different way of thinking, uh, the players. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just different. Um, and they're pretty set in their ways, the way they like to do it. Um, but I think there's a balance between old school and the way they do it now. Somewhere in between is about right. Um, I don't think the current day player or modern day play takes criticism very well. I think they're very, very sensitive. You know, you say you should leave someone out or you say they're not performing and suddenly you're the worst bloke in the world and they think they hate you. I mean, you've got to perform, but cricket is a performance-based game. Modern day sport is a performance-based game. If you don't perform, you're going to come under scrutiny. And I feel for the players because they're under so much scrutiny now with all the social media, there's so many different organisations globally that if something happens, everybody knows about it within minutes and I'm not sure that's right or wrong I feel for the players and that but that's the world we live in so they have to I I think they have to accept criticism a little bit better and maybe some of us older guys that played a little bit and did okay we might know a little bit about what we're talking about not saying we're right but it might be worth just listening and saying weighing up for yourself I remember as a player listening to Ian Chappell and Tony Gregg and Richie Benno and those guys if they said something that was criticizing us or something that we did, I would listen and say, was there any merit in that? Because they know what they're talking about. It's nothing personal. It's just guys that are in the commentary box that have been successful and what we're observing. It's nothing personal against anyone. And if the players don't like us, that's okay. I don't, I don't mind if I'm not best mates with the players. That's okay. I'm there to do a job. And the people that stop me in the street and say, I love your commentary, that means I'm doing it. I feel like I'm doing a good job. If the players don't like it, they don't like it. That's okay. So this player power movement, because there's so much money involved now in all sport and cricket now, as we said, is the second biggest sport in the world. So the money that these players are getting is fantastic. I, I don't uh, begrudge them at all. But with that comes responsibility. And I don't think if the players don't like a coach, you've got to work 
it's, it's like when you've got anything like that, it's why. And you've got to break it down. You can't just say, I don't like this guy or I don't like this coach. Well, why don't you like him? Can we change it? Can he get better? Is he got the right integrity, credentials? and that? It, does he know what he's doing? And you have to say yes with Justin Lang. He's experienced it. Now, we're not in the dressing room. Well, we're only hearing different things from different players. But I, I, I know Justin. I've played with him for a long time. He's intense, yes. And he's old school and he's brutal. But I think that's fantastic. And that's what Australian cricket needs because they haven't been performing. This is not a great Australian cricket team. And the proof is in the last few years about their performances. And the hard work that JL has put in, we're just starting to see this rewards. Now, if Australia can go on to Pakistan and beat Pakistan in Pakistan, beat England next year in the Ashes, beat India in India, defend at home and not lose at home twice in three years, then suddenly we might start talking about this side as possibly this could be a great Australian cricket team. But at the moment, they're not. And they seem to be calling the shots. So something's not quite right there. You talk about player power <laughs> and you talk about the impact that uh, someone like Pat Cummins can have on yep. Cricket Australia. When they ask for feedback, presumably they've been completely honest behind the scenes. I note that Nathan Lyon had a press conference, uh, not a press conference, a media opportunity that was cancelled yep. in the last few days. Marnus Lubbershane had a media opportunity that was cancelled this morning in Queensland. Pat Cummins did media last week, lots of it. And he was yeah. talking about climate change and uh, other causes yeah. close to his heart, but he was unable to say that Justin Langer should get a contract extension. So my question to you is, if I can ask you as a former captain, as a leader, could Pat Cummins have yeah. handled this situation any differently? Oh, he was in a really tough spot, Pat Cummins, like real tough spot, because if he says, I fully support Justin Langer and I hope he gets an extension for three or four years, and then Cricket Australia decide they don't want Justin Langer, then the new coach knows that the captain wanted someone else. And if he goes the other way and says, no, look, I think Justin Langer's time is up. I think we should have somebody else. It's time for a change. And they stick with Justin Langer. He knows he hasn't got the captain's support. So he was in a really tough spot. I think with all of this stuff, with Cricket Australia, just be honest. I, I think if Cricket Australia are honest to say, if they had to come up and said, there's no reason they couldn't have a Zoom meeting the day after the Ashes. Why wait till now? Why couldn't they have done this ages ago? And they say they want to do the Ashes. We'll do it the day after. Why everyone hanging around and speculating and put Pat Cummins in these situations and plays in these situations? It's really tough for them. So I just think the whole handling was terrible. Um, for Pat, I would just like him to be honest and I would have liked Cricket Australia to be honest. If Pat Cummins honestly believed that Justin Langer's time was up, I would have liked him to have said, look, to me, I've given Cricket Australia my opinion. And my opinion is, I think Justin Lang has done a terrific job. We love JL, but it's time for something different and a new voice. And I think everyone would respect that. I don't think Pat would have any issue saying that. Um, and I think if Cricket Australia had come out and said, look, we have loved what Justin Lang has done, where he's come from, what we summarised before from Sandpaper Gate to now, we're starting to see the fruits of that hard work of Justin and say, but we just think it's time for a change. Uh, four years is a long time. Uh, we want a new voice. We want, And I think Justin would have said, okay, fair enough. He might have been disappointed, but he would have understood it. It's like when you're captain and you tell someone that they're missing out on the team. If you say to someone and say, oh, well, you know, sorry, you're 12th man today because of team balance or yeah. just the conditions and all that, people know it's a cop-out. If you say, look, we don't think you're bowling well enough, or, you know, you've got to go and work on your fielding or your batting or whatever it may be part of your game. So, look, until you get that right, if you nail those Yorkers at the end, if it one day cricket, if you can get your consistency back and red ball cricket with the ball, um, then we'll seriously consider you back in the side. So go away and do that, and then we'll consider you again. And the people might not like what they hear, but they'll respect you for being honest. And I think that's where Cricket Australia, Pat Cummins and everyone probably haven't been honest enough, especially Cricket Australia. Pat Cummins was in a tough spot, but Cricket Australia haven't been honest enough. Have you spoken to JL? And if you haven't, what would you say to him if you were speaking to him now? No, I haven't spoken to him yet. I sort of, been, we swapped messages through the whole summer. We spoke throughout the summer. Um, I thought with what's happened the last few days, I'll just leave him be for a bit. Yep. Uh, get back to Perth, be with his family. He hasn't been there for six months. Um, so I'll just let him settle back in. And then when he calms down and the dust settles, I'll give him a buzz. I'll send him a message and say, hey, thinking of you. 
Uh, if you need to chat, I'm here. Uh, that's what friends do. Um, and I think all of us that played with Justin have all come out. We're not coming out because he's our friend. We're coming out, or a great cricketer or, um, you know, Hall of Famer. We're coming out because it's the treatment of the coach. Forget it's Justin Langer. It's just the treatment of Cricket Australia, the way they've handled the situation of the coach of the men's Australian cricket team. It's been pathetic. Would Cricket Australia, on that note, would Cricket Australia have been better to sack him last August rather than put him through the summer, give him things to, to work on? He's done that. We've won. And they, sack, and they essentially sack him anyway. How, like, what could Cricket Australia have done six months ago, eight months ago to, to ease this situation? Well, I think they could have said to him, look, we're, we're looking at other options. Yep. But let's get through the ashes. Our most important thing is the ashes. Now, that's no real comfort for Justin, but they're being honest with him. And then say, the day after the ashes finish, let's all sit down and thrash it out and work it out and come to an announcement as quick as possible. But to let it, when did the ashes finish? It finished six weeks, a month ago, yeah. something like that, maybe just under a month ago, three weeks. There's no way it should have taken so long and let all the speculation and that just hover and let everyone have an opinion and let it build up and then have a seven or eight hour meeting and still not have any. I mean, what are they doing in there? I mean, what are you doing in there for seven or eight hours and still not have any decision? I mean, they've got no cricket now in that board whatsoever. Yeah, they might have a few good businessmen and a few people in there that have been around cricket, but there's not enough cricket people with now that have been in dressing rooms that understand the game. We need people like that on the board. Last one on this before we look ahead. Because this has been handed so, handled so poorly, and as you said, embarrassing, pathetic, do you think head should roll at Cricket Australia? The Nick, Nick Hockley, uh, how, how do you think Cricket Australia should deal with this? Because it feels to me like no one is holding Cricket Australia accountable. It's very hard to. They're the governing body. They're sort of doing what they want. But every single time there's a delicate situation or a controversial situation, they're finding a way to mess it up. Yeah. Uh, if I was the people at Cricket Australia, I'd be saying to Gillian McLaughlin, I feel like a change because I think Gil McLaughlin runs a fantastic organisation at the AFL. Um, I, you know, not everyone might be happy with him, but I think they respect him for being honest. I think they respect for what he's doing and the way he runs his organisation. I think the AFL is as good an organisation as anywhere in the world. And Cricket Australia is probably in the top few that aren't very good. They're just yeah. not doing very well at all. In, in, and that's a long history too. They've never supported... They've, they've been pretty average. So, I mean, I think there should be a commission rather than a board. Yep. I think you get a few ex-cricket players, like you know, the Mark Taylor types. I mean, Tub was on there for a long time. I'd always he'd get my support in anything he wanted to do involved with cricket. Mark Taylor, he was he's absolutely fantastic. So you get a couple of guys like Tub around, and then you get a couple of good business guys. You have some sort of commission. We get five or six people running it. Then you have a marketing team separate. I mean, the marketing of a cricket Australia could get better too. Everything they do could be better. Um, so yeah, I, I think they should be. I should seriously consider it, but it's not going to happen. The states, cricket clubs, vote on a player. Uh, sorry, an administrator. Then they go through that process. He gets on a board that, for Victoria. Then they go onto a board for Australia. They get their free lunches and stuff like that. Well, times change and it's time to get a commission, I think, rather than a board. Yeah, hard to argue with that. Uh, the federated model clearly has fallen down in the last few years and Absolutely. it doesn't work as, as, as well as it potentially used to. All right, what's next, Warney? I heard Ricky Ponting on ABC Radio talking on the weekend. He still thinks that a... a um, uh, a coach that looks after all three formats is the way to go, so not split the role. H how would you go about appointing the next Australian men's cricket coach? Yeah, I'm in agreement with Punter. I, 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 I think the same lines. I think if you could, ideally, if you could find one coach that is good enough to cover all three forms, that's ideal. But they're pretty hard to find. You know, you know, it's pretty hard to find. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Justin Langer goes and coaches England. I, if I was the ECB, I'd be poaching Justin Lang. I'd be signing him up this week. Would he do that? Overs. He's so patriotic, Warney. Oh, it'd be hard for any Australian guy that played, you know, 100 test matches for Australia to coach anyone else. But you know, it happens. You know, it, it happens. It's a job. You know, Justin Langer is a cricket coach. And I, I think he'll feel that all his hard work was just starting to pay off. And now he's sort of been cut short. So I think he might feel as well as he'll feel satisfied with winning a World Cup and an Ashes and done pretty well uh, getting the credibility back to the Australian side, 
I still think you'll feel a bit unfulfilled. And I haven't spoken to him, as I said before. So I'm just assuming that knowing him. But if I was Andrew Strauss, the ECB, I'd say, right, he's a million pound. Come and coach England. And the next Ashes series is only 18 months away in England. I mean, imagine that. Australia, England in England. Justin Langer, coach of the England cricket team. I mean, can we orchestrate that? How good would it be? Um, and Trevor Bayless is probably going to be the Australian coach. And he was coach of England. I mean, how? come on. I mean, who's writing these scripts? Let's get it done. <laughs> That would be awesome. <laughs> Trevor Bayless is the next Australian coach. is interesting in itself. That New South Wales contingent of the team is very yep. strong. He's coaching them before. He's coaching the Sydney Thunder at the moment. From what you know of him, is he the right personality? It strikes me that they've gone from Mickey Arthur, who was intense. We know that. Homework gate, et cetera. Didn't, didn't work for some. Mitchell Johnson was very yep. outspoken against him. And now he's criticised Pat yep. Cummins for his attitude to Justin Langer. I saw Dar- that. Yeah, Darren Lehman more relaxed. Um, and now Justin Langer more intense. So they often, um, they swap between the two. So are we likely to see sort of the opposite of Justin Langer come in? Well, that's what I said before. It's very hard to find a coach that can do all three and all players like. All players aren't going to like the coach. You know, when we had John Buchanan, half the team didn't like him. That's a so fact. What stopped that's you? not so just what- me so what stopped you from giving that feedback to Cricket Australia or the ACB as it was at the time? We never spoke to them. We just respected the position. We respected the person. We might not have liked him and asked him out for dinner, but we respected his position um, and we treated him accordingly. Um, the same, Jeff Marsh, Bob Simpson. We had a lot of guys didn't like those guys, but they respected the position and the person. So just because you might not invite those guys out, what's better, to be respected or be liked? Respected every day of the week, right? So, I don't. If I was head coach of the Australian side, I don't wouldn't care if the players don't like me. I'm there for success, and to build an an atmosphere and an environment for the players where they can perform at their best. I can sit and talk to them and try and get the best out of them, inspire them, uh, and and create that environment. If they didn't like me, that's okay. It's okay as long as they respected me and the position I held. And I think that's what's probably been missing. It seems like a lack of respect um, has been broken down because I feel that Justin lost the dressing room for whatever reason, which is we can only speculate because we don't know. Um, So that's, I suppose, we're guessing, which would be silly to do that. So when John Buchanan was the coach, there was no avenue and and you didn't want the avenue to go and speak to the ATB and say, this isn't working. But by the time Justin Langer becomes coach, they're asking for player feedback and quite extensively yeah. and the players are happy to give that feedback. So when did that balance change? Recently. I, I remember a couple of years ago, I think David Warner got asked who he'd like to open the batting with. <laughs> I mean, you, what is going on? There's something's wrong. I, I, I mean, go and ask Michael Slater or Mark Taylor, who would you like to open the batting with this week for the test match? I, I mean, you just say, it's not my job. It's something the selectors to pick. You'd never give it because who it's the same situation as what I said before. If, if Mark Taylor said Michael Slater and they pick um, Matty Hayden, then Mark Taylor go every, everyone sort of knows that Taylor wanted Slater, but Hayden got picked. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't work. You, everyone has to be accountable and the selectors are accountable. And I think the selectors did a really good job through the summer. I thought they were outstanding. They, they got things right. And they get a huge tick. And when you got someone like Tony Dottermay, uh in there involved, he's fantastic uh, human being, Dotters. So, you know, he, he'll do a good job. So the selectors have done a good job. So the players shouldn't be getting um, spoken to or asked about who they would like in a team or who to open the batting with. That, that just shouldn't happen. Um, and I don't think the players... Um, to me, there's a process that goes through with Cricket Australia. You exhaust every single avenue and every single person that you think might be interested in the job. You then get it down to the last couple. And I remember when I was vice captain and Steve Wall was captain, uh, we sat down with uh, Malcolm Speed and he asked us as captain, vice captain, uh, we've got John Buchanan, Steve Rickson and Greg Chappell. We've got three coaches there. Um, We'll make our decision, but we're just interested in what you guys think. Now, I was sort of a little bit reluctant to give an opinion because of the same scenario that I said, because if we said one, then I just said, look, we've got a pretty good side here. We just need someone 
and I didn't use anyone specific. I just said, we need someone to help us uh, give us a kick up the backside when we're getting a bit lazy and a bit big headed and think we're a bit too good um, and keep us on track, but create an environment that allowed us to be us and just let us play, let us play. We had some of the all time greats in our side at that time. So just let us play and we'll sort it out ourselves. And we did, if there was any issues, we'd sort it out. Um, so it was hard. I just think we've got to be careful about going to players, asking about who should be captain, who you should open the batting with, who should be coach. I mean, I don't think that's the player's job. The player's role is to go out and play and win and be successful and play in the right spirit and win. That's what they should be concentrating on doing. If they do that, the rest will look after itself. All right, let's move on from Justin Langer. I love that warning. You're a passionate man and you've got some great ideas. I am. I like. Look, I love Australian cricket. I, I, I've been involved since 1989 when I got in Victorian State Squad. I played um, Big Bash until 2014. So I played, I was involved in first class national cricket for 25 years and I love Australian cricket. I think when you could tell when I played, I was passionate and loved playing cricket for Australia. Um, and I'm passionate about it now because I think Australian cricket has got a chance to be great. At the moment, they're not, but they have a chance. But Cricket Australia have got to get their house in order. They're, it starts at the top. They're running the game. Get it right, please. For the sake of Australian cricket, get it right because that filters down. And then let's get all the other little things right. Let the players play and play and hopefully start having some success so they can become a great Australian team. They've got a chance. With the bowling side they have, they've got a chance, but they're not great now. Do you agree with Ian Chappell that the captain should have more of an influence than the coach. So Pat Cummins, for example, to take a greater responsibility and the coach should be more in the background, maybe more what John Buchanan was like under Steve Waugh and yourself and Adam Gilchrist and the players at the time. Well, I, I, I'm of that era. I grew up in the late 80s of playing, you know, you played the captain around the show. Um, but I think the coach has a really important role. And I... I I think it's in first class cricket it's, and underage cricket and state squads, it's really important. Domestic T20, all that. It's really important to have a good coaching structure and set up to create an environment, to challenge the players, to help them prepare to get ready to play. Um, at the national level, they don't really need coaching. They need reminding. They need to be inspired. They need to make sure they're happy. You do need to give them a kick up the backside when they need it. You need to put your arm around them when they need it. Um, you just got to let them play because they're great players. And any one that makes international cricket, you don't lose it overnight. It's all got to do with the way you think about the game. You start to think negative and you start to change your technique and all that because you're not making runs. It generally comes down to the way you think and about your attitude. So I would say manager. Yeah, you know, team manager rather than a, a head coach. I'd say a manager role, a bit like soccer or football, where you have a manager that looks after the team, but the captain runs the show. That's how I would have it. So if the coach and captain can't decide about a certain selection or a certain way to do things, captain says, "This is what we're doing," and that's the way it should be done. And that's the way I did it last year with the London Spirit. Whatever Owen Morgan wanted, I said, "What do you want, Morgs? What do you need?" And he'd say, oh, I want this, this, this. I said, okay, I'll implement that. And then we had the coaches around to do that. And then I'd walk around individually to players. I'd have a session with Mason Crane, talk to the opening batters and make sure everyone got what they needed. If they needed anything extra, take someone out for dinner or a drink or have a beer at the bar and just say, how are you going? And have a chat and try and impart my knowledge and experience and try and inspire them to be play above, them, above themselves. It didn't work last year because I had COVID and I was only around for a couple of games. But... Um, that's how I would like to see it run. Lesson learned. Don't get COVID this year so you can be around the whole season. Yeah, that's it's right. Thank there. you. And the uh, London Spirit will win it this year. Come on. Good. I'll, I'll be watching very closely on Fox Cricket. Um, yeah. You mentioned the Big Bash. Cricket Australia again. They've got the fingerprints all over this tournament. It's now 11 seasons in. They're going to be making big and bold changes. Um, there's so many different ideas about how to improve this tournament. How would you go about making it the Big Bash that you played in a few seasons ago? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I probably think we're the third or fourth best domestic tournament now, where I think we were always first or second. We're probably just behind IPL. There was a stage there when BBL for sort of year two, three, four, where we may be a bit better. The skill level, uh, the international players we attracted to Australia were probably, that was probably a great standard of cricket, a bit better standard of cricket 
but we didn't have the passion of the Indian fans. So it was always IPL, BBL, but BBL has slipped way down now. Um, now that's probably, you know, I think the CPL, the PSL, um, so we're probably fourth now, I reckon. Um, and that's reflected in the crowds. You know, we had 85,000 people at the MCG a few years ago for a, now we've got, I think, 3,000. So that's reflected in the interest of the Big Bash because everyone's waning interest because it just goes too long. So for me, how I would structure it, I think the test series is always sort of November till start of January. That's the test series. I would like Shield cricket played up until December to the sort of Boxing Day test match. So if you need someone to play red ball cricket in test match cricket, you can pick them from Shield cricket, not picking them out of Big Bash. New Year's Eve is when we kick it off. We kick it off at the Adelaide Oval, New Year's Eve, and we finish it January 31. So the finals are at the end. So it's a month-long tournament. You can't get the best international players to come over here for eight to ten weeks over Christmas away from their families for the money they offer. And then with the Australian government taking half in tax, if they get paid 100 grand, they get 50. Now, for these modern-day players with everything else available, 50 grand... It's a lot of money, but 50 grand in the context is not much money for these players now. And why would you come to Australia for 10 weeks for 50 grand, 60 grand in your hand? So we've got to do something. So that's what I would do with the Big Bash. That's what I'll do with Shield Cricket. It just makes sense. Uh, It's got to be shortened. Uh, How you do that, do you play each other once and have more finals? Um, Do you have your local derby uh, as your second game? So you only play... You know, do you add two teams and say we have 10 teams and you play nine games a year? And I, I still think we can play a lot more double headers, triple headers. These players can play on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They can play back-to-back games on a Friday and a Sunday. You know, triple headers Friday, triple headers Saturday, triple headers Sunday. Have Monday as a single game, Tuesday single game, then go double header, double header, and then pick up the triple headers again. I think you can do that. and. I'd, you've got to have shield cricket up until Christmas because you can't be, if something happens, if someone gets injured in the test side, you can't have them picking out a big bash or what they did two months ago. It's all about picking guys in form. So I think it's pretty simple. It starts New Year's Eve in Adelaide and it goes for a month, no more. Maybe add ten, two teams or maybe not. Just make it seven games. The only reason it went to 14, I think it started, it started at 34 or 35 games. Yep. Yeah, yeah around that and now it's 61 yep. is it so it's nearly double and that's why it's going nine ten weeks and that's why everyone's losing interest it's just too long mm-hmm. but having said that the other side of the coin is is it a tv sport rather than a, an attendance sport so the numbers were pretty good through the whole summer so if the numbers if the tv like fox sports channel seven and everybody else in cricket australia are happy with the tv audience then that's a different kettle of fish don't, we don't care about the crowd. It's a TV sport. That's what they have to make up their mind. Is it a TV sport or do we, obviously you want families there. At the start, we had families, you had kids, you had boys and girls playing cricket and watching it, painting their face. It was fantastic. That's gone. So is that because of COVID the last two years, people have got used to Fox putting on such a great coverage that they say, you know what, let's just stay at home. Is money and financials got so much tighter because the pandemic has affected everyone so much, which it has, they decided to stay home and watch it. Is that one of the reasons? I still think if it only went for a month and we played every team once as it stands and you had a few more finals, you'd still get more people to watch, um, both in attendance and on TV. Yep. Oh, you make some great points, Warney. We're running out of time, so we've got to move on. The Pakistan Tour is coming up. I know it's early. Yep. Are you happy to just put your balls on the line, as you love to do, and tell us <laughs> what your 11 will be for the first test match oh. in Pakistan in those con- now bearing in mind, there's no warm up game. So Australia is going to go over there. And the first time they play in those conditions is going to be against Pakistan in a test match. I think it starts on March the third. Don't hold me to that. Of course you can watch it on Fox cricket early March. Yeah, I think it early, is Yeah, early March. So there's news today from Ben Horn that Marcus Harris will be on the flight. Joe Richardson is going to be rested. Scott Boland will go across. What's your 11 starting from the openers? Oh, I think the last test team that played in Hobart, but Josh Hazelwood will come in for Scott Boland. Yeah. I think that'll probably be the team. 
Yep. So not that's, an extra spinner, not a Swepson? I think Swepson will go there, but I don't think they'll start with that because Travis Head can bowl a bit. We saw Steve Smith bowl a bit. Labuschagne can bowl a yep. bit. And at the end of the day, we're only looking at that fifth bowler to bowl 10 to 12 overs. And when you've got Cameron Green bowling so well, he could take the new ball if you wanted to. Yeah. He's that good. Uh, I'm a big fan of Cameron Green. He's going to be a superstar. What we saw with the ball this year was he was as good as anyone with the ball. Um, and with the bat, we saw some signs that he's got some serious talent. So he'll be there. And with him there, you could play two spinners, but I think you'll see the same team. But Hazel would come in for Boland for the first test. Uh, I mean, I'd love to play Scotty Boland, but I think Hazel would start Cummins, pick themselves. And when you've got Travis Head, Smith, and Labuschagne to bowl, a bit of part-time stuff. I think they'll probably go with that to start with. And if that doesn't work and they produce Bunsen burners over there the turn, then one of the quicks will probably miss out um, and uh, Swepson will come in. All right, last question for you, Warney. What has Shane Warne got planned over the next few months? What can you tell us? What are you up to? <laughs> Surely you've got a few fingers um, in the pies. Yeah, look, we're pushing my 708 gin. That's going well. We're about to get into a couple of thousand stores. So we're doing that, uh, launching a few new RTDs, which is cool. I'm um, heading to London for Sky Commentary um, for there over there. Uh, be involved in the IPL in some capacity. Um, and then I'm, I might take a break. Australia Sri Lanka next uh, starts at the end of the week up in Sydney. So I've got four of those games I'm commentating on. Then it's time for a bit of a break two or three week break in the sun down here in Melbourne. Yep. Um, not rainy Sydney. I'm not, I want to stay away from rainy Sydney. <laughs> I want to come down to sunny Melbourne. Um, and that's it. And that, that's sort of the summer. And then we do that. I've got the head coach of the hundred in August over in the UK, the Dunhill in Scotland in October, and then yep. back here for the Australian summer. Make sure you're plenty of practicing, practice your putting, your chipping. I've been hearing your short that's game's it. very good warning. You need to be good over there in those yes. conditions. Yes, thank you, Tommy. Thank very, you, mate. Very good. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. We love you on Fox Cricket this summer. Look forward to seeing your work. Um, well, first starting off against Sri Lanka in those T20s, but also the 100 overseas. And then next summer as well, it's going to be awesome. Now, nah, good on you, Tom. Thanks for having me, mate. Thanks, Warnie.